Hey there, Vernacular Faithful. Redcoat here. And Sienter joins him. And we've got another podcast for you. This one will be part of a series of casts digging into the concept of complexity when looking at the design of games and the various intricacies of designing your game's complexity to have a positive impact on the overall composite experience of said game. Complexity is, shockingly, complex. There are a lot of aspects to it, some that give your game depth and others that cause a barrier of entry. It all has to do with learning, really. But what is complexity? Well, if we go off the dictionary definition, complexity refers to how difficult a concept or idea is to understand based on how complicated or intricate the various elements that comprise that concept or idea are. In other words, complexity is a measure of how hard it is to comprehend something that is made of multiple parts or based on multiple concepts. This gets us the right mindset, for sure. As this applies to games, complexity is used to mean stuff to learn. In other words, it is how much there is in the game to understand. Note that when we're talking about complexity, this is not in reference to how much the player has to learn in order to play the game. Rather, it is simply referring to how much there is to learn in the game proper. What the player has to learn to play the game is a related idea called the barrier of entry, which we'll tackle a little bit later. Each game object, and this is per our definition, which, if you recall the first episode of this season, includes everything in a game, even systems, adds to a game's complexity, as it is something the player can learn. Game object complexity manifests in four different ways. In other words, to fully understand a game object requires a full comprehension of four ways that the complexity it has is expressed. Briefly, before we get to them in depth individually, these ways are 1. Comprehension. How well do you understand the object by itself and its place in its environment, what it is and its reason for being? 2. Situational. How well do you understand it in context with other game objects? 3. Strategic. How well do you understand the implications of this object and how to make effective use of it? And 4. Execution. How well can you actually make use of this thing? Are you able to perform the actions necessary to use it? So let's dig in on these, shall we? First up, we have comprehension complexity. This is the base understanding of what a game object is and what it does with respect to the game as a whole. This can include things like understanding that you have the ability to jump and that it is for ascending, or that a potion is used to heal characters and that it is used to keep them from dying. One might initially think that most of the complexity that comes from comprehension is uninteresting and certainly not something to build a game around. However, puzzle games like Professor Layton and the Zero Escape series thrive on the concept of comprehension complexity, bringing in new objects and concepts for the player to try and understand with each new puzzle in the composite experience. Next is situational complexity. This is really about understanding how objects interact with each other. What is particularly important to remember with this is that, because it relies on interaction, it scales based on the number of current game objects and possible interactions. This sort of complexity is most often learned by the player becoming familiar with specific situations. A great way of understanding this is chess. During any given turn, the current player has to figure out which piece to move. The first step to this is identifying which pieces he or she can move, where they can be moved to, and, most likely, what pieces the opponent has and where they can be moved to. The novice sees new board situations all the time, but as you get experience, you learn to recognize common configurations. This understanding of situations allows you to process the situational complexity more effectively and efficiently. In general, there are three broad factors that create stress out of situational complexity. 1. Density, or how much there is to process in total. 2. Intricacy, or how many interactions there are to process. And 3. Time pressure, or how much time you have to process in. It is important, as a game designer, to understand the stress that your game's situational complexity is creating, for reasons that we'll delve into later on in this podcast. Moving on from there, we've got strategic complexity. This refers to what the player needs to understand when it comes to the implications of the game's systems and concepts, and how to use them to achieve a desired outcome. In essence, strategic complexity is how difficult it is for the player to make a decision that gets them closer to their goal. One example of this concept is in Pokemon, where there is a great deal of hidden information, so the player must decide what to do based on what they think the opponent is going to try to do to win. For instance, any Pokemon that the opponent throws out will have a resistance and a weakness. The basic strategy would be to attack the Pokemon's weakness, possibly knocking it out, and getting that much closer to winning. However, if the opponent decides to switch that Pokemon out for another that resists that attack, the player will deal significantly less damage and possibly take a counterattack that knocks their Pokemon out instead. 
Understanding the likelihood of either situation based on the opponent's proclivities and the current Pokémon on the field is a function of an understanding of the game's strategic complexities. Such calculated decision-making doesn't just apply to turn-based scenarios where the player has a great deal of time to consider the best plan of attack, but also in more reflexive games such as Street Fighter or Bayonetta, where a new strategic decision is made during each second of gameplay based on the flow of battle. Regardless of the time frame, deciding what scenario is the most likely outcome of an action and choosing what actions to take based on that decision is what strategic complexity is all about. It lives in the nuanced and subtle implications of the game's systems that allow the player to understand what the game or an opponent will do in response to their actions and how they will be affected. And finally, we have executional complexity. This has to do with being able to actually, that is physically, do the thing. Not all game objects add to this, for example a health bar doesn't have any execution required, but anything that you directly manipulate has this. So a menu has some amount of executional complexity, though usually very little. Fighting games usually have a lot, as they require complicated controller manipulations in order to perform numerous game actions. Rhythm games also have executional complexity, though that tends to be more about getting a timing, that is the rhythm, than about correctly performing a complex sequence of actions. Executional complexity does tend to draw from situational complexity, as it often involves recognizing a situation and reacting to it in a way that results in successful execution. So now that we've talked a bit about what complexity is when it comes to the composite experience known as games, we have to ask the important question, what does complexity do for games? Why should we even care about it in the first place? Complexity gives your players something to learn and master. This can be a very engaging process. Unfortunately, it also creates things that your players have to learn in order to play, and depending upon how this gets presented and handled, it can discourage players from playing your game. The things that the player has to learn in order to play your game is that barrier of entry that we mentioned earlier. It can be something as simple as knowing how to jump, or something as complicated as memorizing all of the moves a particular character has. In either case, there is a requisite understanding of certain base concepts or actions that the game possesses that the player must have before they can effectively play that game. It is important to recognize that the actual minimum the player needs to know to play the game may in fact be lower than the player thinks it is. For example, a player may hear about all sorts of fancy moves in chess, such as castling or en passant, but you don't need to know these moves to play chess. You only need to know how turns proceed. White goes first, turns alternate between white and black, and you can only move one piece in a turn. How each piece moves, pawns only go forward, for example. That your pieces can't share a square, how to capture enemy pieces, and what check and checkmate are. Well, that's still a lot, there is also a lot that players don't need to know. They don't need to know any of the fancy advanced moves, as mentioned earlier, or any of the strategies, for example. So while there is a lot to learn to play chess, there is a lot that doesn't have to be learned in order to begin playing it. This is stuff that can be learned later, and much of it contributes to what we'd call the game's depth. Now, depth is the more positive outcome of complexity in your game. As Cienter stated, it is the elements of play in your game that can enhance the play experience, but are not required for basic play of the game. This can include concepts like the specific effects of all the power-ups in a shooting game, or the idea that counter-hits enable different combos in fighting games. Generally speaking, depth is the measure of the amount of things the player can learn about playing your game. This aspect of learning new concepts and ideas to enhance play can grant the player a sense of accomplishment whenever they learn or master a new concept, possibly opening up even more concepts for the player to learn. Moreover, each new idea can further enhance the base play experience, allowing the player to get even more out of the game than they could before. An additional benefit of this learning process is it creates a sense of investment in a game. That it does. So you're probably wondering, now that I know how complexity affects level of depth and barrier of entry, how do I manage complexity in my game, Redcoat? To that I answer, ask the Cientier. He knows. So, as we mentioned earlier, each game object adds complexity to a game in different ways. This complexity is always going to be a combination of barrier of entry and depth. The player has to learn some minimum amount about how the object works before they can use or interact with it. There is also likely more that the player can learn about that game object beyond that minimum, so it likely adds depth as well. In this way, you can think of barrier of entry as the cost you pay for depth. Also, there is a difference between the barrier of entry to your game and the barrier of entry to using or interacting with any given game object. 
Some game objects will add to your game's barrier of entry, but not all will. Remember, your game's barrier of entry has to do with the initial experience. It is like the entryway of a building. The barrier is like a door that the player has to open to step inside the building that is your game. Some stuff will be part of that front door, while other stuff will be doors to rooms within that building. While all doors matter, your very first goal as a game designer is to get the player inside the building. With this being the case, that front door is by far the most important one. The way to find out which door is the front door to the building that is your game, aka the barrier of entry, is finding an understanding of just what is really required to play your game at a level that is engaging. This means that in a game where you have the ability to jump, shoot, and do loop-de-loops, if the player only needs to jump and shoot to finish the game, then your barrier of entry is learning how to jump and shoot. This means you don't necessarily have to teach the player how to do loop-de-loops for them to be able to surmount the barrier of entry to your game. Moreover, if you only teach your player how to do loop-de-loops, they have a significantly smaller chance of surmounting your game's barrier of entry. If your players can't get past the barrier of entry, they are likely to stop playing your game and possibly ask for a refund. Warning. As you know everything about your game, probably, it is really easy to lose track of your complexity, especially your barrier of entry. Experienced players will also undergo this phenomenon. As such, it is really important to keep the new player in mind so that you don't unwittingly overwhelm them. One way of mitigating the negative effects of barrier of entry is to space out necessary mechanics. This is why tutorials so often introduce mechanics slowly and build them up. The barrier of entry of the very first part of the tutorial is much lower than the full game. You can also introduce things later. Players are much more willing to overcome small barriers of entry after they've formed an initial investment and engagement with the game than they are to overcome a large initial barrier of entry. I know we've been focusing on barrier of entry a lot here, but that's because it matters a lot and can be easy to underestimate, especially for seasoned game players. So how about that depth? As the more positive outcome of your game's complexities, having a good amount of depth in your game can enhance your player's engagement and grant them a sense of investment as they seek to learn all there is to learn about your game. Returning to the game as a building concept for just a moment, you may recall that we noted that the front door of the building was the barrier of entry to your game. Taking it a step further, everything behind that door is your game's depth. If one were to open the door to this building only to find a tiny room with nothing in it, they would be very underwhelmed and wouldn't hang around in the building for very long, especially if the door happened to be rather hard to open in the first place. On the other hand, a building with a lot of depth has many rooms inside, each with their own pieces of furniture and art for the player to engage with. It should be noted that all of these rooms have doors as well, and may require some effort to open. These doors, which I will refer to as engagement barriers, are what the player has to overcome to reach individual elements of your game's depth. Generally speaking, if the initial room of your building, we'll call it the lobby for now, is uninteresting, even if there are other doors in the building to open and their contents are interesting, the player may not bother to open or even look for those doors. Conversely, if the lobby is super full of interest, the player may not notice that the other rooms are there to begin with. To be sure, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, as the player is staying inside of the building. Just be sure that none of those other rooms contain anything vitally important to the player's experience. The concept of your game as a building allows us to dig into the relationship between barrier of entry and level of depth. Essentially, the ratio of barrier of entry to level of depth could be described as how large the first room of the building, or lobby, is when compared to how difficult the lobby's door is to open. Each individual element of the game is another room in the building, with its own ratio of level of depth to barrier of engagement. These ratios can be good or bad for your game. You want more level of depth relative to your barrier of engagement. Remember, the former helps your game, while the latter can only hurt it. While evaluating these ratios is a topic for the next podcast, I do want to give a shout out to Mark Rosewater's article on lenticular design, which can be found with an article search at dailymtg.com. This article served as an initial starting point for this podcast. In it, he discusses complexity as it relates to Magic the Gathering, and while we necessarily had to expand our thinking on the concepts he presented in order to account for a broader range of games, it served as an invaluable starting point. Lenticular design, by the way, just refers to game objects that have a good ratio of level of depth to barrier of engagement. In other words, lenticular designs have good depth bang for your barrier buck. Anyway, that concludes this podcast. 
We have a lot more to say on the topic of complexity, but it's going to have to wait for next time when we delve more into how the different manifestations of complexity impact your game, both positively and negatively. So tune in next time for part two of our complexity cast. But for now, it's time for the sign-off. Until then, this is Cientier, signing off. And this is Redco, signing off. Play the games you want to play, boyos.